this is not going to be a spoiler-free vlog. I'm not even going to try on that front. And I think you know exactly what is being spoiled because, as Tara said, everything is Sherlock and nothing hurts. And if it does, it's the kind where you don't want it to stop. I'm going to tackle this video, as the vlog mothers would say, in seven parts. The first five are going to be my top five moments slash scenes slash general things about a scandal in Bulgaria. Um, the sixth will be my top one least favorite thing about a scandal in Bulgaria, and part the seventh will be uh, my hopes and dreams for the future, because I have enough emotional investment in this that I have hopes and dreams for the future. Number five, the bedsheet. The bedsheet seat had to be on there. And I mean, okay, there were good things about it, besides the fact that it almost fell off. The other good thing about it was that moment when Watson walks in and he's just been, like, abducted in a helicopter, and he walks in to, like, the palace, and his best friend is sitting there with nothing but bedsheet on. And he just kind of surveys the scene and he's like, okay. Like, like, that is my Watson. Four for you, John Watson. You go, John Watson. Number four is not a specific moment, it happens multiple times, and I'm sure it will happen much more in the coming episodes, which I'm looking forward to, but it is the violin playing! Violin is probably the most common instrument that, like, is played in films and movies and TVs and, and you know, just on screens, because everyone knows what they are, they sound nice, and they're relatively easy to fake if you're an actor and you want to look cool. Like, you can look cool going like this. Everyone knows what this means. However, unfortunately, people don't always realize that, like, there are a lot of people who have played the violin in the past, or who still play the violin, and who know what it's supposed to look like. A lot of people are gonna know if you are so into faking playing the violin that you're not bothering to line up what's going on in your fingers with what's going on in the actual soundtrack. And okay, I'm not, I'm not, like, obsessive about this. I'm not. Really, all I ask is that the bow strokes line up a little bit, you know, the best that they can do with the music. So I was extraordinarily pleased to see that this was in fact happening. And then a little while later, um, I was I was kind of watching, and I was and I was watching his fingers on on the left hand, and I was like, oh my god, like those fingers are producing more or less the right pitches in kind of the right order. Oh my god! So I went online and discovered that they did indeed hire a violin coach for Benedict Cumberbatch, which is like, blows my mind with with how awesome it is, and that is, that is, that kind of thing is why I love this show and why I love the BBC. The BBC does this kind of shit. I remember watching David Tennant's Casanova, and I think it was in the scene where he first meets the singer, I forget her name, um, the one who's a man, but she's a woman, and they fall in love and stuff. But anyway, there's kind of like a little group of musicians behind them, and so because I'm a musician, and so my eyes were kind of drawn into that part of the screen, and I noticed that there was a serpent, okay? A serpent is this, this predecessor of the bassoon, which is the instrument I play, um, and it's actually, like, that, that's probably what would have been played. It, in that time, at that part of the world. I'm not an expert, but I, I, it, it looked accurate. And I'm actually considering running to someone about that and being like, I noticed that, and it made me really happy, just so you don't think people don't notice this shit, because they do. So, again, four for you, BBC. Number three, Naked Irene Adler. Okay, so two out of three of these points so far have been partially about naked people. However, um, in this case, there have been a lot of um, criticisms of this part of the episode because, you know, it's a part where um, the, the, basically the female character of this episode is, you know, appearing naked and using her naked body as her power. Um, and there are definitely um, some valid feminist, feminist critiques of Stephen Moffat's work. However, I disagree with this particular one because, in this case, um, she's not using her body as a sexual tool in that in that scene. Um, Sherlock Holmes' power is that he can look at someone and know everything about them from, you know, from what they're wearing, from how they look. And so she's the only person who has thought of the obvious solution, which is to remove the evidence. 
and it works. She baffles him, which is awesome. And it's not, you know, it's not particularly sexual because both Sherlock and Irene kind of know that he's not interested. Um, the only one who kind of makes it into something like that is John, which is, you know, a little bit his role in many uh, iterations of Sherlock Holmes. So that was a great scene because it's something really obvious about the Sherlock Holmes superpower that nobody's ever bothered to explore. Like, how would you outwit Sherlock Holmes? You take your damn clothes off. Number two, the brothers. Mycroft really got a lot of attention in this episode, which was great because um, up until now, we've only kind of seen him as this very distant figure. You know, he's introduced as Sherlock's arch nemesis, which is, you know, clearly Sherlock being melodramatic. However, this was the first time which we really saw them being brothers and in a relationship that anyone can recognize as, you know, everyone's relationship with their siblings. Like, yeah, they hate each other sometimes, but that scene at the morgue where they're smoking cigarettes and talking about, you know, why they're different from other people, um, <clears throat> for the first time, it's like, they're just, they're just two guys. And they're different in terms of their relationship to the outside world. And they're different from each other in terms of how they chose to direct their gifts, but they're brothers. Um, so that was a great scene, and I liked it. And number one, I think my favorite single thing about this episode was the Mrs. Hudson bits. Specifically, um, after she's been interrogated by the American. And John is, you know, fussing over her as requested. And um, Sherlock just walks in. No, 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 she's not in shock. And John recommends that she, you know, go take some rest in the country. And he. Sherlock wraps, wraps his arm around her and said, John Watson, shame on you. Mrs. Hudson leave Baker Street, England would fall. And it, it was just like, it's in the middle of so many different awesome things about the, about the Sherlock Holmes thing. Because it's such a distinctively English piece of culture that it's like they're making reference to the fact that they can do, you know, they can take so many liberties with Sherlock Holmes and they are. But they have to do it justice because if they, you know, if something is out of place like that, if Mrs. Hudson left Baker Street, England would fall. That is how important this cultural object is. And it was also just such a great moment because it's one of the moments in the episode, of which there are actually many in this one, where you see Mor Moriarty being proved right um, when, you know, at the end of the great game, he says, we both know that's not quite true. He does have feelings. He has feelings. He, he has a lot of love for a lot of people, and Mrs. Hudson is one of those people. Um, so yeah, those are my top five things. And now I will move on to my top one least favorite thing. And yes, it does have to do with Irene Adler, and I'm sorry if I'm harshing anyone's squee. If you don't want to listen to this, that's fine. That's fine, you can turn it off now. However, um, I didn't like the ending. I didn't like it. Um, the point of Irene Adler, to me, is that she's, she's the woman because she beats him. She's smarter than Sherlock Holmes, and he respects her because she's smarter than him, not because she can match him, not because she gave him a good run for his money, because she beat the pants off him. Um, and I'm still kind of trying to understand why that was kind of disregarded, and Obviously, many people on the internet are putting it down to, well, if it is sexist, which is, I guess, a possibility. But, um, I like to think that there are other narrative reasons. Because the whole plot did, I think, work. And I think the ending worked as a part of a plot. I'm just not sure it worked for my relationship with that piece of the canon. Um, so that leads into my hopes and dreams for the future. Um, the hope and dream which was created because of this episode is that Irene Adler will come back and win some kind of more decisive victory because that's what I expect from her <laughs> and that's what she deserves, I think. So I hope that, you know, that little bit at the end about her being alive and kind of in cahoots with Sherlock a little bit um, was not just some crazed imagining of one of them, it was a little bit hard to tell, a little bit Inception-esque there um, with the ending. <laughs> But, um, uh, 
obviously this was supposed to be the Irene Adler episode, so I don't know if she, people are necessarily expecting her to come back, but then again, this was the Irene Adler episode and there was Moriarty in it, so there's no particular reason why it can't be the Head of the Baskervilles episode and have Irene Adler in it, or the Final Problem episode and have Irene Adler in it again. So, that's the first thing. And the second thing is kind of like the ultimate unpopular opinion um, in any fandom. Like, this is just not a thing that people think, but this is a thing that I think about Sherlock Holmes and about Mr. Sherlock in particular because they've done so well by everything else that I would want out of an adaption that I can't help but hope this impossible hope. Namely, I want the main character to die. I want him dead as a doornail, 100%, no coming back, no adventure of the empty house. That is what I want. And I realized that even if it were canon, this would never happen. Because, you know, if you are a TV executive, generally, killing off the franchise characters who pull in tons of viewers is, like, not a winning strategy. Um, so... <laughs> That's not gonna happen. However, I will explain why I want this with all of the fiery passion of my fangirl heart. When I first read Sherlock Holmes, I was nine years old, and during the adventure of the final problem, I was bawling. Like, I mean, by that point, I was so attached. I mean, I'm sure everyone understands being ridiculously attached to fictional characters. But the thing about the final problem is that it's a good ending. It's good. It's it's brilliant and you cry and then you kind of look at, you know, the hundred or so pages that come after it. I mean, depending on which edition you buy, obviously, maybe you have a whole separate... Anyway, it doesn't matter. You look at... Clearly there's more after. And you feel kind of cheap because it was a good ending. It was a good death and you were so upset. But like a good kind of upset. It's, it's good that something can make you feel that way. Um, the only other time I've cried that much because of, like, a fictional narrative is when Ten died. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it just, it makes the emotion of the end of the final problem, which is beautiful and awesome, feel cheaper. And then, you know, after that, it was never really the same. I mean, I, I love The Adventure of the Empty House. It makes me smile when I read it because it's funny and... It's, you know, full of friendship and happiness and love and... But, to be like, there aren't a lot of really, really great stories after, after that. And I would just love the entire thing so much more if Conan Doyle had resisted, you know, the people uh, walking in the streets with black armbands, which is amazing, I would do that. <laughs> um, and, and stuck to his guns. Who knows if, if it would be as big if he if he had done that. I think it would be. But um because this this um adaptation, the Sherlock um T V show, has lined up until I've been Adler anyway, but I'll ignore that for now, has lined up so exactly with everything that I love about the character and about the stories. <clears throat> I just kind of wonder if like Maybe someone else feels the same way, and maybe it'll end after the Reichenbach fall, and I know it's not going to, and I know that, um, probably, you know, if anyone's actually watched all, like, 15 minutes of this, you're, like, mentally throwing rotten tomatoes through the screen at me, but, uh, you know, you win already because it's not gonna happen. Um, but I'll be happy with, you know, more Sherlock. I would just be happier crying. I mean, that's the kind of person I am. Anyway, this has been a very, very long video, and I'm very, very sorry. Um, congratulations if you actually made your way through all of it. And um, next time, I will make it shorter. <laughs> I promise. And um, so it was very nice meeting you all, and I'll be back in two weeks talking about something. Maybe Sherlock, maybe something else. See you then.